Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, February 1st. Welcome to a new month, 527 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are off a little bit this morning. Uh, we did have higher closes in the row crops yesterday, but back lower to start off a new month. Let's start off with Argentina in this heat wave. According to the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange, a heat wave is forecast for the majority of Argentina's farming region over the next week. Following the above normal temperatures, rainfall is expected throughout northern, western, and southern Argentina. Argentina's central and southern regions, however, are forecast to remain dry. Recent increases in Argentina's corn and soybean crop estimates could be revised lower without adequate rainfall over the next uh, over the coming next over the next few weeks. So you're talking 100 degrees in some of these key. Uh, corn and soybean areas in Argentina for another five days. And it's it's summer. I mean, it's hot. This is not totally abnormal. This is above. It's above normal as it relates to the temperatures. So this goes on for another, uh, call it five or six days, through like at least Tuesday, Wednesday next week. And then that's when some of the rains return. So in this Euro, which goes out 10 days, these rains, most of them are kind of uh, during the back half of the 10-day forecast. So you've got five or six days here of, of hot and dry. And, you know, anything beyond that time frame is difficult to predict. So, yeah, there's there's a good chance that you see rains return after that time frame. But it's it's absolutely not a guarantee. Um, a lot of the estimates have come up for Argentina corn and soybean production. If this um, hot and dry pattern were to build or persist or these rains miss, they may have to come back down. So I think the market is paying attention to this. Is, is this why corn and soybean futures uh, were able to rally Tuesday and Wednesday? I don't know. It, it might have something to do with it. I don't know if there's a big catalyst for that. Let's uh, let's jump to that. Corn and soybean futures were able to hold their ground yesterday following Tuesday's upside reversal. After sp after spending most of Wednesday's session lower, nearby corn and soybean contracts were able to finish the day with a modest gain. Technicians might argue that the higher closes provide some degree of validation regarding Tuesday's reversal, aside from the usual back and forth fourth regarding South American weather, that there does not appear to be a single fundamental catalyst for the two-day bounce. Yeah, so you had your reversal Tuesday, which was great. You were able to shrug off fresh lows, finish higher. Yesterday's session was interesting. So you spent most of the day lower yesterday in, in corn and soybeans. And then uh, late in the day, you came back and finished with some just very marginal gains. So from a technical standpoint, I'd say that at least for the moment, uh, this kind of keeps the idea that uh, maybe Tuesday's reversal pattern actually meant something. It keeps that idea intact. Now this morning we're off again. And ideally what you'd like to see is something similar to yesterday, you know, a lower start, but, um, maybe some big fund who's short or whoever decides that they want out and they bid up the market again, uh, today, similar to what they did yesterday. So we'd love to see some additional follow through here in the corn and soybean markets. The wheat market uh, was not able to rally yesterday and did finish lower. If you guys have not checked out our premium content, you need to do so. Joe, can you tell me about the video you put together yesterday with Brian Split? Brian was on yesterday. Uh, we did charts, but specifically one of the things we discussed was March basis contracts. So there are a lot of March basis contracts out there. First notice day for March uh, grain futures is February 29th. So uh, in the days prior to that date, you're going to get a phone call from your grain buyer. and They're going to say, hey, you got to make a decision here. You've got to either uh, price these basis contracts out or you've got to roll them and eat the carry. And neither of those prospects is, is especially attractive right now. You've got a low March board price. Uh, the carry is, is substantial and, and can really eat away at you if you decide you're going to roll these basis contracts. So what Brian tried to do and, and what I tried to get out of him was, uh, hey, if we're looking for upside targets over the next three weeks, what should they be? What what are some uh, reasonable upside targets, uh, specifically in the March corn and soybean contracts that you should be looking at? If you guys want to see the premium stuff, go to standardgrain.com this morning. Uh, this is a $50 per month subscription. You can cancel at any time. No other fee, no other obligation. Nobody will try to sell you anything else. This includes our morning email, which goes out at 5 a.m. Central Time every single business day. That email includes a whole bunch of information, charts, graphics, um, all of our grain marketing recommendations, and our six most recent premium videos are included every single business day. Give that deal a shot this morning, guys. I'll forward you a copy of this morning's email.
U.S. ethanol production increased last week. Weekly output of 991,000 barrels was up 21% on the week, but down 2.1% versus the same week last year. Ethanol stocks were pegged at 24.3 million barrels. The print was down 6% compared to the previous week and down 3.2% compared to the same week last year. The weekly decline in stocks of 1.5 million barrels is the second largest on record. Implied gasoline demand was up 3.4% compared to the previous week and up marginally versus the same week last year. On average, over the last four weeks, implied U.S. gasoline demand is up 4.3% versus the same period last year. So we had a couple of really bad weeks of ethanol production, I think mostly as the result of weather. I pulled this data from Reuters this morning, and what it shows is a big spike down in margins just temporarily. And I think there was a spike in natural gas prices that was the result of weather. And I, I was actually, I've heard that there were some plants that sold off their natural gas inventory because it made more sense financially than to actually grind corn for ethanol. I don't know how much truth there is to that. But in any case, you go back to those, uh, I think, two weeks of poor production, and they really kind of set us back in terms of, of the pace of ethanol production versus USDA projections. We had been on track to exceed USDA's uh, corn demand via ethanol target by 50 or 100 million bushels. And now it kind of looks like, yeah, we're going to meet the target or maybe exceed it by a little bit. So those uh, those two weeks of bad production, they did set us back and, and are in my view, kind of a more negative for the corn market. I had been really optimistic about ethanol, that we would exceed USDA's target, that they'd have to come up, and now uh, not so much following those two weeks. The total U.S. cattle inventory has dropped to its lowest level in seven decades. As of January 1st, all cattle and calves in the U.S. totaled 87.2 million head, a decline of 2% from last year. This is the smallest inventory since 1951 and the fifth consecutive uh, year of decline. The beef cow herd declined 2% to 28.2 million head, the smallest herd on record. The 2023 calf crop fell 2% to 33.6 million head, the smallest calf crop on record. And beef replacement heifers dropped 1% to 4.8 million head. The report confirmed that producers remain reluctant to rebuild the herd, mainly due to drought and uh, high input costs. Mackenzie, I'm not a cattle person, but you are. And I look at this chart and it looks to me like this is an incredibly friendly situation as it relates to cattle prices. That is correct. Both uh, feeders and fats. So this is the story that we've been trading for the better part of what, a year and a half now? Yes. I mean, at least. And this is the result of, of drought, which has been multi-year drought in mm -hmm. a lot of areas, high feed prices. What else? Yes. Uh, lack of profitability across the board. It's hard for uh, guys to stay in the game when they don't see a lot of incentive uh, to keep going. We have these really good prices, but they're still not getting ahead that far. So this confirms the story, but as, as far as like, you know how reports go, uh, versus pre-report expectations, we were pretty close to, to expectations. Yep, we were pretty darn close. So this doesn't mean that we're going to go higher or lower on the open in cattle this morning, but uh, absolutely seems to confirm the uh, longstanding story. The Fed left interest rates unchanged on Wednesday and signaled, signaled that rate cuts aren't likely in March. According to Fed Chair Jerome Powell, before, before cuts can be made, more data is needed to confirm inflation's downward trend. Fed officials believe there is no reason to cut rates quickly due to the strong economy and robust labor market. Economists are now projecting cuts will begin in May. Yeah, Powell pretty much said that they're not going to cut in March. Um, he said, based on the meeting today, I would tell you, I don't think it's likely that the committee will reach a level of confidence by the time of the March meeting. Yet the interest rate market is still indicating a 35% chance of a cut in March. But uh, I don't know, the way that they talked yesterday, it, it seems unlikely. We'd love to see, I don't know if we'd love to see, I think a lot of you guys would love to see rate cuts. I mean, cheaper money is is a big advantage when it comes to any sort of agricultural operation. But uh, rate cuts could have consequences. Also, you could get a reinflation event, which I think is their concern. They want to get they want to make sure this inflation thing is under control. And inflation is as far as the Fed is concerned, inflation is one of the worst things that can happen. So they want to make sure that they get this thing eliminated, I guess. So I don't know. Still a 35 percent chance of cut. Powell doesn't talk that way, though. 
The stock market notched its third consecutive month of gains during Janu Jan January. Stocks declined on Wednesday after the Fed announced rate cuts were unlikely in March. The Dow Jones lost 0.8%, the S&P dropped 1.6%, and the NASDAQ fell 2.2%. Despite the losses, all three indexes finished January in the green. For the month, the S&P 500 gained 1.6%, the Dow increased 1.2%, and the NASDAQ climbed 1%. For the first time since, since September, oil prices also saw positive, tr positive trading in January. WTI crude finished the month 8% higher at 76.28 per barrel. So good action, generally speaking, in the stock market. Yesterday was an especially ugly day. Uh, the market hated what Jerome Powell had to say. The S&P lost 1.6% yesterday, which was the biggest daily loss on a percentage basis since September. I still think it looks good overall. This is ha, has been a bull market since what call it September, October of 2022. We've been trending higher gradually, but um, yesterday was was a nasty day. We're a little bit higher in stocks this morning. Uh, we did cattle. Um, we have an export sales report this morning at 7.30 a.m. Central Time. Corn sales expected for the current marketing year, 800 to 1.3. Soybean sales, 500 to a million. Uh, wheat sales expected, 275 to 600. Outside markets, U.S. dollars up. Uh, stocks are attempting a recovery here. The S&P is up 16 points. The Dow is about flat. Gold's down 19 bucks. Crude oil is up 62 cents at 76.47 in the March WTI. Have a great day, guys. We'll talk to you on Friday.